And we're just glad to be with you this morning. Glad to be able to worship with you. This is a, a different time. You're worshiping at home. We're worshiping here. In just a minute, we're going to sing. We're going to sing some songs. We're going to sing some hymns. And we want you to participate. Now, I know it feels weird sitting in your easy chair and your rocking chair and your couch, whatever. You may still be in your jammies. That's fine. It may feel weird to, to sing and worship the Lord, but it's a very important time that we not miss the fact that Jesus wants to be worshiped. More than that, he deserves to be worshiped. It's something that will allow him into our life in a way that, is, that, that nothing else will. And so we want you to join in this morning, uh, but let's begin with prayer. Can we today? Father, I wanna thank you so much for your grace and for your mercy toward us. Thank you, God, that in this time where we cannot meet together, when the church all over America, even all over the world, sometimes cannot gather, that little groups of believers can gather together, even through uh, the internet, and we can lift you up and worship your name. And Father, today, we just ask that you would take glory from what we do, ask that you would help us as we seek to honor you and to love on you and to worship your name. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, Bob and Diane Rosalind are going to come and lead us in worship. We want you to sing where you are, okay? Thank you, Stu. We're happy to have him here today. This morning, we're going to be singing three hymns. And if you have one of the church hymn books, it's hymn number 636. The name of the song is going to be called Jesus Never Fails. And I want to... Say, how do you do some friends from up north? Why the loss? Earthly friends may prove untrue, doubts and fears are saved. One still loves and cares for you, one who will not fail. Number 649. 649. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. The fix my choice. I'll be my Savior and my God. May this holy heart rejoice and tell its raptures all of God. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to walk and pray and live rejoicing every day. Happy day, happy day. Jesus wash 
sounded not really but uh, the difficulty is 
we are made to be a part of each other. Did you know that God never intended anyone to be a Lone Ranger Christian? God never intended mankind to play out our walk through this life alone. Oh, there are individuals that uh, can be the rugged individualist and live their life as a hermit somewhere. But that's not how most people are prepared to live life. That's not how God designed life. And uh, so this is very different. Um, just so you know, those of you who um, may not know how this comes about, Pastor Ed got a lot of things set up this week. Um, and uh, we come together and uh, kind of follow his plan uh, from what he's been doing, uh, logging in. And and uh, he's just done a tremendous amount of work. I appreciate uh, him getting all of that ready. But uh, this is very different when he speaks, um, when we're doing this, because there's so little feedback. Uh, if, uh, if someone agrees, usually there's a nod, or if uh, someone is not interested, there's someone falling asleep. But the fact is, um, it's, it's very unique and different. And I'm sure it's unique and different for you not to be able to worship with people around you. But there's some things that God has called us to do still to be a part of each other. And part of that is to pray for one another. And so before we look in the word this morning, we're gonna pray for a number of needs and uh, I am not uh, normally a part of the congregation here, but I know a number of the needs. So we're just going to bow and, and ask that you would join us as we pray together uh, for these uh, who have needs this morning. So would you would you bow for prayer today? <clears throat> and as we begin, would you just uh, I'm sure there are people who particularly are on your heart, maybe people that you're worried about, people who during this time have to uh, continue working, who might be out in the public more. Just going to give you a moment. Would you lift them up to the Lord? Ask God to put a hedge about them. Lift their name up before the throne of grace and ask God to protect them. Perhaps they work in a hospital or uh, uh, maybe they deliver food. Perhaps they're uh, part of uh, public service, uh, police, fire department, ambulance, someone in the medical community. Um, someone is uh, acting as a, in nursing capacity or a doctor. And maybe this week you've forgotten to pray for them. Would you lift them up to the Lord right now? Ask God to put a hedge about them. Father, I know the church here has been praying for Randy in Canada, um, a friend of Pastor Ed's. We lift him to you and ask God that you would surround him with your care and bring healing to his body. Remind him of your great care over him. Father, perhaps there are some this morning who have had the, uh, the virus um, and are recovering from that or battling that. God, we lift them to you today and ask that you bring healing to them. You've asked that we pray for those who are sick, and we ask that you would just honor that uh, instruction that you've given to us by bringing healing to them. And Father, those who are tuning in from other states, ask that you would Help not only those in Michigan, we God all over our country. Father, the different rules and regulations that we all live under, the, the laws that have been passed, the orders that have been given by the different states, ask that you would bring out of confusion, that you would bring order. God, that you would bring provision for those who are struggling because of a lack of provision. Father, those who've lost loved ones, even during this time, ask that you would comfort them, give them grace, and Lord, for ourselves, we ask that you would speak to us today. Father, there's not a lot of life that we can live through where we can do it on our own. We try to, but we fail. So God, would you help us today as we hear from your word? Open it to us. Give us encouragement. Convict us where we fail. But God, help us to trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. The church has been in Nehemiah, and uh, Nehemiah is... Uh, uh, just an, an incredible servant of the Lord. Last week, Pastor Ed talked about how Nehemiah exemplified loving God and loving his neighbor. Those were, those were Nehemiah's priorities. And it's interesting how the Old Testament um, is uh, uh, so seen oftentimes as something that just prepared the way for the New Testament, where in actuality, God's plan for, for men and women all along is to have a continuity of seeking the Lord and 
loving him and loving others. And uh, Nehemiah was uh, an example of that. I'm impressed that during this time of difficulty, this time of quarantine, I've been reminded how important it is that we understand the basics of what God has put us here for, the basics of what Jesus did for us to bring us to him so that we can be with him. I heard uh, uh, during this time, I've done a number of meetings and heard a number of meetings online and heard the testimony of the young man who was talking about his walk with the Lord. And he said, uh, this is a young man who, who has testified of Christ's saving grace in his life. And yet he said uh, something like this, I hope I've done enough good to outweigh the bad. And in my head, I couldn't say anything, but in my head, my head exploded because I was reminded that that is the exact thing that Jesus came to free us from. And we forget that. We feel, somehow feel that what Jesus began, we have to complete. And it doesn't work like that at all. Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, all the religions, even naturalism, says I have to do more good in this world than I do bad. And somehow that will bring benefit to me. That will bring grace to me. And God will see me as something other than who I am. And he'll forgive me and allow me to live with him in eternity. I'll be a good person then. But the fact is, that's not why Jesus came. Not at all. He came because we cannot, uh, we cannot become who we need to become. We cannot free ourselves from the bondages of sin that we have without him. I have to tell you that this is a, a very different experience speaking to uh, a camera. This is a very unique. If you see me look down at my notes uh, every now and then, it's because I'm used to moving around a little bit. And uh, this is uh, uh, just between you and me. It's freaking me out a little bit, okay? I'd like for you, if you have your Bibles with you, to, to turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 19. <clears throat> just before the law is given, just before God gives uh, the, what we call the Ten Commandments, the, the beginning of the law being given, he speaks to what he's done for his people and his hopes and aspirations for them. And in Exodus 19, they're standing beside uh, Mount Sinai. And in verse 3, it says, And Moses went up unto, the, un, unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, You shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel. And he begins to say what he did for them. He says, You've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. They didn't bring themselves out of Egypt. They didn't bring themselves to God. God says, I brought you. Where did he bring them to? To a place of worship? No, no. He brought them to himself. He says, I brought you to, unto myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant. Notice God didn't say keep our covenant. He said, keep my covenant. He was the one who established the covenant with us. We could not establish a covenant with him. We could not come to a point of agreement with him. He had to begin that, and we have to come into agreement with it. He says, then if you'll do this, he says, then you will be a peculiar treasure to me, a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. He didn't say a kingdom with priests. Yes, they would have a priesthood. Yes, they would have a hierarchy of how the, the people of Israel were to approach God. Yes, they were to have a hierarchy that God would establish so he could help the people of Israel understand what it meant for their sin to be forgiven. But in actuality, he says, I want you to be a kingdom of priests. I want you to be a kingdom where the people themselves are able to approach the Lord, not just in ceremony, but in truth. I want you to be a kingdom of priests so that you can influence the other nations. I want you to be in particular, a holy nation, a set apart people. He says, God said, these are the words that you'll speak to the children of Israel. Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all the words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all the Lord has spoken, we will do. They had to come to a point of agreement where they said, I think God has made a good plan and I'm going to agree with that plan. I want you to turn over in the New Testament to the book of Ephesians chapter 2, where we'll spend probably most of our time this morning. It's a familiar passage of scripture if you've been in church for 
any length of time at all. In Ephesians chapter 2, I'm going to begin at verse 1. He says, and you hath he quickened or brought to life who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation, our livelihood in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, wrath, the wrath of God abided on us, his he was turned away from us. But God, who's rich in mercy for his great love, for with he loved us. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, for with he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you're saved. I'm impressed that just like in the Old Testament, God had to initiate the covenant with man. That's exactly what he's saying here that Jesus has done with us. He has initiated the covenant, the final covenant, the new covenant that's written in his blood. I'm told that when uh, the famous football coach, Vince Lombardi, was beginning a season. Now, the, the Green Bay Packers in their day when, they, when the National Football League first started were the premier team. But every time he would take these elite players who were paid not as much as they are today, but well for their day, he would get them together and practice, these people who made their livelihood on football. And he would take a football and he would hold it in front of him and he'd say, this is a football. He says, the goal of this game is to take this football and take it to the opposing team's goal and to keep them from taking this football and taking it to our goal. And then they begin their practices. But it's interesting that he always began the same way, because the fact is, if we lose sight of the basics of what Jesus came to do, we will somehow feel that the effort comes back on us. We'll somehow feel that it's our responsibility to create our own grace, to find our own mercy. And that's just not true. This is a football. In learning to love God and learning to know God, it doesn't happen by education. Now, I believe in education. I believe that you should uh, get all the education that you can afford and stand. But the fact is, no matter how much education, even Christian education we have, we'll never educate people to learn to love God. God revealed himself to us, and all we can do is respond to that in the same way that on the mountain of God, God had to establish his covenant and say, here's what I'm going to do. In the same way, in the New Testament, God said, here's what I'm going to do. And you can respond to that or not respond to that. And he illuminates us and gives us an opportunity to respond to his word, which he's inspired. And this love response is very important. It's where we connect with God. And that is what, again, what all of the religions of the world do not have, they do not have the ability to say, somehow this isn't dependent on us. Everything that we have being brought out of sin, the picture in the Old Testament of being brought out of Egypt, being delivered unto God, all of these things, somehow we want to be dependent on us. But that's what God says is not happening. Even some who would use the word church in their name somehow feel it's dependent on them, but it's not. A love response to him is simply an understanding that God establishes the work and we need to come in agreement with it. We need to align our lives with it. There's a love response to the cross, a love response to Jesus to the love of God that he says he demonstrated to us. In verse 4 it says, But God who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Rich in mercy there literally means overflowing in mercy. There are times where I've left a hose on my garden. I garden. I have a tendency to garden. Um, how many of you are going to put in a vegetable garden this year? Let me see your hand. I'm just kidding. I can't see your hand. But the fact is uh, I love gardening. 
But there are times where I've left a hose on in an area far too long and I didn't have to water again for two months because they had sufficient amount of water. God desires to leave the hose on in our life. The amount of mercy that he has toward us is so rich that he doesn't turn it off. It is overflowing. The great love with which he loved us before us, before our grand, our parents, our grandparents, from before people, from before there was matter, conceived in the mind of God, you were loved. Do you understand that? Before there was anything else, he loved you. His great love. We're an everlasting creature. Everlasting means we have a point in time and we go on from there. God, on the other hand, is not everlasting. He's eternal. He doesn't have a point where he began and goes on from there. He has a, he has a point from infinity that he had. If my hand's off the camera now. I don't know if you can see that. But anyway, it's far, far in infinity to a point that is everlasting. God is eternal. And his great love for us began in eternity past. I want you to think about that for just a moment. You know, all the things that have happened in your life, all of the circumstances that you faced, sometimes very happy, sometimes very difficult. God has loved you in such a way that is a great love beyond anything you can imagine, beyond time immemorial. He began loving you. God loves us eternally. It's a great love in its size, in its quality, in its depth of meaning. There are times where I've received gifts uh, at Christmas time, white elephant gifts. You know, you get a little plastic toy. And somebody's it thinks it's cute. And I go, that's nice. And set it aside. And it doesn't mean anything. But then there are times where I've received the nastiest, grubbiest, picture that you can ever imagine from my little grandchild and that goes on a place of honor because it has great meaning to them it has great meaning to me god loves us with a love that has great meaning he loves us eternally with a longevity that we cannot imagine with a scope that is all-encompassing he loves us with in every facet of our lives you say what about the ugly parts yeah he loves us there too what about the parts where i'm ugly not where people have been ugly to me he loves those too what about the things that in my life are broken that were none of my fault he loves us there too with his great love this is the love that he asks us to respond to but in verse 5 he also says that we were dead in our sins, and that's the love that he asks us to respond to. It's one thing to love the child that is compliant and enjoyable. You ever have the child that wakes up grumpy? Maybe it's a husband, maybe a wife. There's some of us who are morning people, not me in particular. I live with a morning person. She wakes up extremely sparkly. I, on the other hand, am difficult to love in the mornings. I know you probably don't have that problem, but some of us do. She loves me even when I'm not sparkly. God loves us when we're not sparkly. The term that he used there, he says, when we were dead in sins. When we were dead in our sins. You see, we're not bad people. Somebody says, says, uh, well, you know, they, they, they were okay. They, they weren't a bad person. The Bible doesn't say we're bad in our sins. The Bible says we're dead in our sins. And there's a difference. And I want you to understand this. Things that are dead can still hurt you. There, uh, I grew up down south and uh, drove often through the mountains of Kentucky and Tennessee. And there are signs that say, watch out for falling rock. Beware of you know, beware of falling rock. And the fact is that stone is inanimate and the gravity that pulls it downward is not alive, but it can still hurt me. The sins that deaden my heart, that made me desire to do whatever I wanted and not do what God wanted, those weren't because I was bad. Those were because I was dead 
and they're just as deadly even though I didn't recognize them at the time. It says that even when we were dead in our sins, God had this great love for us. Do you understand that? It's one thing to love those who love us. It is very difficult to love an enemy. Now, some of you who had much experience with this, you say, well, God can give you grace. But I want you to think about this for just a moment. Someone who is truly your enemy, someone who truly desires your failure. They don't just want it. They actively work for it. God says, I loved you even when you fought against my plan. Before I became a Christian, I had values that were so far out there, unimaginably beyond anything that God would want. I had, I had values for myself, for other people, the way I treated people, the way I looked at people, the secret thoughts I had in my heart. All of those things were against God's plan. It would be as if I showed up at the mountain of God, Mount Sinai, and Moses says, I want you to be a, a special people unto me, a peculiar treasure if you'll obey my covenant. And on the outside I said, sure, but on the inside I said, that's not going to happen. God says, I loved you anyway. And I showed it to you through allowing my son Jesus to come, explain what the kingdom of God was like, the rule of God was like in a person's life, and die to make sacrifice for your sins. Rise again so you could live a new life, a changed life. When you were dead in sins, it says he quickened us together in the King James. He made us alive together with Christ. Together with Christ. A lot of times people think that's together as in together with the body of Christ. But it means to be together with Jesus. One of the things that's happened, <clears throat> I, was, I was listening to a friend, he was sharing some things about this time of quarantine. He, he lives out in the country and he, he said, I, it, he took a walk out in the fields. He says, I, in fact, he says, I, I've prayed more and, and been alone together with the Lord more this time than I have in a long time because of the lack of pressure to be somewhere else. I believe that one of the things that we neglect as part of the basics of walking with the Lord is focusing on being with Christ. We don't read the word of God to learn a set of principles that we can work through. We don't read the word of God to um, just get a formula about the 12 steps on how life works. We read the scripture to understand who he is so that we can fellowship with him, commune with him, because God has a desire to be with us. Listen to me. God did not make us alive in him so we could go, still go do whatever we wanted. He wants to be with us. He wants us to take time with him. One of the greatest things that I've been encouraged in the last year is to uh, pray through the scriptures. I will confess to you that is a difficult thing to do, to really focus on that. Because I'm, I'm unpracticed at it. I'll read the scripture and then pray. But to pray through the scripture has been... Uh, something that's new and unique and rich to me more. But through it, I find that togetherness with Christ, that he wants to be with us. The one who loves me from eternity past gave himself for me, made me alive in him so that we could be together. You say, well, I'm kind of alone right now, Brother Stu. I'm sitting in my living room by myself with my uh, footy pajamas on or my fuzzy slippers. I'm pretty alone right now. You are not. God has desired to be with you. And it says that because of that, he saves me by his grace. Brothers and sisters, I will tell you that God's desire under the old covenant was that a particular people would follow him. Now, he had many designs on those that people but he always desires a people to be with him. But he made that finally available to the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross. And if there's anything that will happen during this time that we should gather is that he still wants to be with us. I don't mean he wants to be around you. He wants to be with us. He desires to be near to you. And where you or your family or your 
your acquaintances may not uh, be able to, to gather, he still can be with you. Through Christ, we have a closeness to the Father that is amazing. I would just ask that you would consider this. Some of you who are watching this have walked with God for years. You understand a closeness with the Lord, with his spirit living in you. But some of you may not understand that Jesus desires to be your closest friend and that he gave himself on the cross so that you might be with him, that he might be with you. I tell you that you can remedy that today by inviting him into your life. Jesus is as close as your cry to him. When I was a young man, my wife and I had gone from Michigan back to our home in Kentucky and there came a point in our travels, we were going through uh, Cincinnati, which is a fairly metropolitan, busy uh, highway, interstate highway, <clears throat> and our car lost power. Our battery died and uh, we were in the middle lane and traffic was going on either side of us all heading the same direction, but we, we couldn't get over to the, um, we couldn't get over to the, uh, the side of the road. And uh, some cars, a car stopped behind us and uh, there was a car that didn't see everyone stopped. And so they ran into him and he ran into us and there were more police cars showed up than I'd ever seen in my life. But as the car was slowing down, I was actually asleep. And Diana woke me up and she said, the car has lost power. I need you to pray. And I looked over and the car was, the, the, the needle on the car was slowly going down. And, and uh, I sat up and I didn't say, dear God of Rehoboam, Jeroboam, and all the other Boam boys, today I called out for your help. I woke up and I said, God, I need your help. God, we're going to die here unless you help us right now. I shouted it out. There are other times where I haven't shouted at the Lord, but I've been just as sincere. And if you're in a place where you say, I don't, I don't have the Lord. I don't know who God is. And I don't really understand how he could love me. He loves you with a quality and a, and a, and a depth and a breadth of love that is very real. From eternity past to eternity future, he loves you. And he came and gave himself that we might be with him. So today I encourage you to cry out to him, call on his name, ask him to do something that you cannot do yourselves. And that is to have his grace and mercy poured out in your life through Christ. Can we bow for prayer? Father, I feel like very often you, you look at us and, and think, uh, how did they begin well? And, have not followed on well. We hear your voice and we don't always follow as closely as we should. And God, I believe it's because somehow we get off track and believe that our walk with you is dependent on us. When you desire to be with us the whole time, Father, would you help us just to remember the love that you have poured out. It was a design that you had from you, the time you called your very first people, Israel, through today. And the love that you have for us was before we began, before our parents began, before generations beyond us began, before the world was started, you loved us. God, I pray that you would help us as we respond to that. That is all we have, God, is just to be able to respond to you. And to say, Lord, that's what I want. I, I want to be with you. But more than that, God, I, there are some here today who may have never taken that step. I ask that you would help them to cry out to you. We can't do it for them. I ask that you'd help them. Jesus, I need you to come into my life and show me mercy. Thank you that you love me, that you gave yourself on the cross for me. And Jesus, I want to be with you and I want you to be with me. Father, I pray that you would help us to remember the basics as much as the football coach said, this is a football, God, I pray that you would help us to say, this is the love of God poured out over my life, that Jesus came for me. And we thank you, Lord, for what you've done and what you're going to do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to listen to me very carefully. Remember, that reading the Bible, praying, 
being encouraged by other people. Yes, somehow you still have to connect with other people. I don't care if you have to call grandma five times a day before you get her. You need to connect with somebody. I don't care if you have to call your 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 children and, and uh, get them out of bed at night. That's fine. But you need to connect with people, particularly those who will encourage you. I don't I don't care what it takes. You need to remember that the basics of life involve Christ being with you. I encourage you to read your scripture. I encourage you to be diligent in seeking him. Cry out to him during this time. Allow God to work in your life. Connect with people. Love on them because God has a great plan that not only would be to be together with him, but with his people. And in just a short period of time, we'll be together again. The Lord bless you. Have a great Sunday.